obviously John Stewart's a hard act to follow, but I think Craig Venter might be actually more difficult. But in a way, I'm, I'm actually very glad that he was able to give that presentation before we, we took over this panel because he really, I think, brought home the fact that there are amazing breakthroughs out there, potentially, out there in the, in the lab, a lot of amazing work. Anyone who works as an injury reporter, like I do, gets bombarded with emails about all the amazing things that, 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 that are close to happening. But what we want to talk about here really is, is how to transition that from the laboratory and bring it actually into commercial scale. Um, to go back in the morning, I think we really emphasize the fact that that's an enormous challenge, uh, that we have a very well-established energy system. And much more so than I think with other forms of high tech, this is going to be a hard thing to display. So the question is, how will we get out of this, how will we take these ideas and get them to the point where they're actually making a difference in the market? Um, now, we have a great, audience, uh, sorry, a great panel to talk about this. Uh, to my left, left is Vim Vermas, who is a professor in the School of Life Sciences at ASU. And as you just heard, he uh, directs a project to create fuel from bacteria. Uh, to his left is Tom Hicks, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy at the U.S. Navy, uh, who oversees really all matters for the Navy uh, pertaining to energy conservation, energy efficiency, uh, and green initiatives. And if you don't know that, I'm sure Tom will talk about it. Um, the, the Navy is doing some really amazing things on, on energy uh, and on energy efficiency. Uh, so, Vim, I can start with you. I mean, you, we, we just saw your, your video, and in terms of the work you're doing, you're in the lab really right now. You're, you're developing those techniques. How do you, what do you foresee as the path forward for, for something like what, for what you're working on? I mean, how do you get it, an idea that's, 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 that's creating great papers, creating great academic work, and how to actually begin to make a difference? I mean, what's the step for you? Um, uh, I think that uh, the first uh, issue here that we have to uh, think about is <coughs> uh, look for what is needed and then try to work to word that. And what is needed is that you have. Oh, did you have to put a button, I think, <coughs> on the inside? OK. Sorry about that. No problem. What button? To push? Uh, I believe it's uh, select. Right. OK. All right. Sorry. Um, that we are trying to look for what is needed and then try to work to word to where you need to go. Um, I mean, that's really one of the things that people in uh, academia haven't typically been doing. They do what they like, and then if there is an uh, application, then that's good. Um, but in the uh, um, energy field, it is such a big problem, and it's such a huge uh, application that you kind of have to look for where you want to be and then work back how do you get there. So what we have been trying to look at is how do you want to produce things? Um, if you want to just grow algae and then extract fuel, extract oil, that's not going to be cost com competitive from what we have seen. Um, you have to find a way that you take the uh, processing out of the picture. So that means that if, what, if at all possible, you have to secrete whatever you, your fuel is going to be. That also takes out of the picture uh, nutrient limitations because then if you view your organism as a, a biocatalyst, uh, um, you can just uh, essentially be independent of the biomass. The biomass is just there. It has grown once and it produces for a long, long time. So that takes out of the equation those issues with uh, phosphate, with other limiting nutrients. So what we're uh, trying to do is uh, use photosynthetic microbes to excrete. Uh, what we have is uh, fatty acids. Uh, Venter is on the same path. And then those get chemically converted into alkanes and uh, jet fuel. So uh, essentially you have solar energy plus CO2 with the organism as a biocatalyst uh, making uh, alkanes uh, eventually. So it's a, a direct solar to fuel type of transition that takes out of the equation uh, the issues of, uh, you know, you have to uh, make electricity or you have to make fuel no matter whether it's light or dark. Um, in this way, you can just make your fuel during the day and you can use it during the night. 
So that's kind of the pathway we have been uh, going for. But the real important picture here is that you make something that you think is going to be a scalable thing. And that's oftentimes what uh, academia uh, generally isn't really looking for. Right. We'll, we'll come back to the details of that. Um, just to, who just joined us is Daniel Betts, who is the director of fuel, sec fuel cell technologies for, for Enerfuel. And you know, if, if Vim is sort of the, the, the scientist in the laboratory in, in academia still, Daniel is working for a company uh, that's trying to commercialize uh, a new a clean tech technology, trying to actually sell it. Um, so Daniel, maybe just talk a little bit about the work you're doing, uh, what you're actually doing with, with fuel cells in terms of the company, and also maybe just begin to outline some of the, the challenges. Once you actually have the technology, now you actually have to do the work of finding the market and making sure that you, you can succeed. Right. Right. Can you hear me? Um, did you? You gotta press a button on top, sorry, that turns it green. Hello? Oh. Did it work? Let me see. Right. Oh, it should work. Oh, there we go. There you go. Technology's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of it. Uh, well, um, uh, yeah, I work for, for Enerfuel, which is um, the fuel cell entity of uh, NR1. NR1 uh, produces lithium ion batteries uh, for electric vehicles and grid energy storage. And uh, NR Fuel is developing uh, fuel cell systems that work in, um, in synergy with the battery. And uh, the idea is, is to, um, uh, of, of having a fuel cell company along with a battery company has been that we're projecting um, into the future what are the limitations that exist on the rollout of um, vehicle technology. And what are the things that um, are external forces that may prevent and, and increase the uncertainty associated with, with the rollout of electric vehicles and uh, grid energy storage technology. And, um, and then to use technology uh, such as fuel cell that is complementary um, in order to reduce the potential effect that those barriers have. Um, on the electric vehicle side, for example, um, when we are uh, uh, introducing electric vehicles, um, there are major, major barriers. One is the uh, barrier of energy storage uh, in a battery. Uh, uh, batteries um, uh, don't have as much energy um, packing capacity as you know, normal internal combustion engines or gasoline. And therefore, you have limited range of these vehicles. And the, the other side to it is that you need to charge them up, and therefore you need to have a plug-in infrastructure for them. And so uh, we believe that there's definitely a market for this uh, due to the, the way that um, you can segment the market into having city cars or fleet vehicles that are electric and, and electric vehicles can do a very good job. For the wider consumer market, this is a little bit diff more difficult. And so um, the industry recognizes this, and, and therefore we're moving into PHEVs. Um, uh, uh, which has an internal combustion engine. But when we forecast that, we realize that the internal combustion engine has to become smaller and smaller and smaller. And therefore, the, the efficiency and emissions of the internal combustion engine um, become harder, you know, the em efficiency drops in the, and the emissions uh, increase or potentially increase. And, and therefore, a fuel cell may be better suited for that application. And, um, and uh, one of the things that we're, we're looking at is, is, is basically in the scale up, is trying to have a pathway to a technology that is ultimately useful and, and less dependent on, on, um, on, on government infrastructure or, or, or infrastructure in terms of fuels, um, like most of the other vehicle technologies on the electric field have had. Uh, one of the interesting things that happens is that, that um, as, we're looking, as we're looking at this technology, we're not concentrating on just replacement of the internal combustion engine, but we believe that the adoption of new technologies is primarily done uh, by offering the user an enhancement uh, over the existing technology. And so the electric vehicle um, allows to do that. Uh, you get a um, great torque, et cetera. Um, you get a, a lifestyle um, where you are free of the, of the, of the perceived burden of environmental, you know, uh, uh, the, the environmental damage that you're creating by the, with, the, with the vehicle. But um, with the introduction of the fuel cell, we're, we're looking at, at ways of really enhancing the, the, um, the comfort and the, and the value of the vehicle. For example, the vehicle um, with a fuel cell, uh, the fuel cell can is, is a, uh, produces zero 
toxic emissions, it produces lower CO2, but no nitrous oxides, uh, CO, uh, sulfur dioxide, and, and, and all these other terrible chemicals. And, and thus, it can stay running in the vehicle for while the vehicle is parked or idle. Um, this has enormous benefit. It can recharge your batteries at very high efficiencies, but also it can provide comfort system for your vehicle. So your air conditioning could stay on or be, be, be turned on before you get to the vehicle. And therefore, you eliminate the concept of having a vehicle that is too hot or too warm. The, the other thing that you can do is have the, 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 the fuel so provide its heat for the vehicle, and therefore you eliminate forever the idea of having to scrape ice off your vehicle. So once you start doing things like this, um, the, the value proposition of, the, of this vehicle changes completely from being something that is equivalent, but something that is dramatically enhanced over the, uh, over the, the existing technology. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're, we're sort of always looking at how to increase the value proposition of the technology and how these technologies come, come together to change the lifestyle of people in a way that is it's, uh, uh, irreversible. Uh, I give an example. I mean, I live in Florida, and uh, we have air conditioning in homes. Let me tell you, um, that makes living in Florida <laughs> possible, in my opinion. Um, but also, it's re irreversible. Once you have it, you're never going back. And so you'll pay for it. We'll return that idea because it's obviously the point that you know, an idea won't scale unless it's something that, that offers something additional to, to, uh, to an audience and a, a consumer. But of course, the question, I think, is going to be what, what really is additional. And, um, for Tom, in the Navy and the Armed Forces really are, in many ways, they're a major consumer of energy. They're sort of the last part of this equation. If it starts with, in the, it starts in, a, in, in university, it goes to a company. You're the ones who are actually using energy in a mass scale. How can you, and, and what, are, what is the Navy doing to shape that market, to, mm -hmm. to maybe encourage the, the scaling up those kind of technologies in a way that perhaps private consumers or a private company would be less able to do? Right, yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, notably last week was the uh, 236th birthday of the, of the Navy. And I think if you look back at the history of the Navy, uh, we have, a, a, I think, a, a history of being at the forefront of energy revolutions. So we went from sail to coal to power our ships. We went from coal to oil. We added nuclear, and uh, I'll, I'll say safely for the last uh, you know, better part of uh, 50, 60 years for that. And, and all along the way, we had challenges. Uh, we had known infrastructures that we were trading for, unknown infrastructures. But in each case, it was the right thing to do. In each case, uh, we added capability to the, to the Navy. And we think, as it relates to advanced alternative fuels, that this will be no different. And then that we're going to be part of this as well. We're going to have some challenges that we'll work through, but, but this will be no different. We've seen, uh, we're also aware of a number of studies. Uh, and I think uh, just the last uh, uh, speaker before us uh, you know, talked about the future of algae maybe being 10 years out. We've, we've seen studies, whether it's MIT or LMI, and there's been a number of others that say, you know, this market won't be mature until 2020, 2025. Uh, we can't wait that long. Uh, and, and so we're doing something about it. But let me just tell you, before I get to that, let's tell you why. And, and for us, energy security is national security for us. If you think about it, the, you know, where we buy our fuel, we buy our fuel from one of 600 places around the world. Ultimately, that fuel is sourced from, uh, more often than not, countries that don't necessarily share our worldview, our perspective. And the alternative fuels offers us the promise to, to make changes there, to really be thoughtful about whom we purchase fuel from in the future. Uh, and and, and that's, that's something that's really important to us. And as you can imagine, that has strategic implications too. If we're getting more of our fuel from ourselves, uh, and being more ener energy independent, if we're getting more of our fuel from countries that we are aligned with politically um, uh, and otherwise, th that this has strategic impacts for us as well. But, but there's another piece to it, um, and, and it relates to this. So what we see in the current fuels market, we all know the trend over time is up, and, and, and you know, it, it, it's, it jumps around, it spikes up, spikes down, uh, but it, the trend is overall up. For us, though, that we can absorb that trend but the spikes just kill us, right? So let me just give you an example of that. So in the past year, um, the price per barrel fuel that we pay in the Navy has gone up $38 a barrel. To put that in perspective, uh, as an organization that consumes 30 million barrels of fuel per year, that's a billion dollars over the course of a year 
of budget uncertainty. A billion dollars that we didn't budget for, a billion dollars that Congress is not going to provide to us, especially in this climate. Um, and so how, what, do we, what do we do? Well, that impacts uh, how frequently we steam our ships, how frequently we fly our planes. So literally we have countries, if you will, that ha are you know, organizations that control that price of fuel that have some say into our ability to conduct our missions or train uh, and so on. Uh, certainly that does not affect operations in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and Libya and things like that, but, but certainly it has, a, it has an impact. And so that, that's why you know, we're really interested in alternative fuels and really think it has, uh, is the, the, the way of the future. Now what are we doing about it? So we could wait until the market uh, is able to deliver fuels in the quantities and the price points and wait till 2020, 2025 and say you know, we're, we're, we're there. We have stated goals that by 2020, half of our uh, fuel will come from alternative sources. Um, but we know we need a ramp to get there. We also have stated that in 2012, we're going to demonstrate our interest in this area by uh, having a, a carrier strike group go out in local operations on 50-50 blends of alternative fuels. And then in 2016, going back to the Great White Fleet at the turn of the last century, we're going to deploy that strike group, send it out over the horizon, look to unwrap it along the way. Uh, we think those are powerful signals, but we also um, to the market, but we also know we need to build a ramp in, uh, to getting fuels, again, they're at the right price points and in the right quantities for us. So what are we doing? So um, uh, since uh, March of this year, we've been working with USDA and DOE uh, as requested by the President, the Navy, uh, requested the Navy work with USDA and DOE uh, to accelerate the alternative fuels market in this country. Uh, what we have done since signing an MOU between the three organizations has, has, has committed over a period of a number of years uh, collectively a half billion dollars of investment that we will seek a price match from industry uh, using existing authorities, powerful authorities that have existed for the last 60 years, whose purpose, by the way, is to stand up industries where, there are, 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 uh, where it's been identified as being critical to defense needs and energy is one of those, uh, has been identified as one of those cr critical needs. So we're looking to use that authority uh, to identify, and, or I shouldn't say identify, but to address the risk areas that can help stand up this ca capacity and capability in this country. So prior to March, and actually ongoing, I should say, we've been very engaged with industry. We've talked to the, the companies themselves. We've talked to um, venture capital. We've talked to, uh, and, and I shouldn't say talk to, we have ongoing relationships with them. Uh, as well as institutional investors, academia, and others to understand what are the risk areas, what, what, what's, what's preventing this market from uh, uh, being a mature market that's capable of being competitive with petroleum. And what we hear are kind of three risk areas. One is feedstock risk. You know, in many cases, we're, we're, we're standing up new segment of the agricultural community or others uh, that, that don't exist today. Two is, I would kind of call it CapEx and OpEx. Um, you know, is there enough money to, for the bricks and mortar, the ongoing operations of the plant? And the third would be offtake risk. You know, do we have a customer there that can take and it can have a long-term relationship and contract? Uh, and what's attracted us uh, to the Defense Production Act and led us there is that that can address all three of those areas. We can share risk with those companies in all three of those areas. Um, and in any d varying degree. Um, so if a company needed more effort on the feedstock side and less on CapEx, you can do it. It's very flexible. Uh, we really see this as the way that we're going to execute the going forward so that we can ensure that the fuels uh, won't be competitive in 2020 and 2025, but hopefully in 2014, 2015, and 2016. And I think these authorities are very powerful and will allow us to do that once we get the, all the funding necessary to, to uh, align to support that. Um, uh, and uh, again, this is an authority uh, that's been around for 60 years. This is not intended to be a long-term government subsidy. The point of the Defense Production Act is to create a market and get out as soon as you can. And, and, and so we're looking at this as a two, three year, four year effort period. And then at the end of that, we as a customer will be there. And uh, the last point I'll make is you know, how, why is this different than what the government's done before? And I think it's different in one, you know, key area. In, so USDA, USDA and DOE have, as many of you probably know, loan guarantee programs and, and grant uh, programs 
related to alternative fuels. What was missing in those, though, and I think those are those in many ways are, 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 are necessary, and, and there's a lot of goodness, as we say, in the Navy is coming out from those. Um, but what's missing is a customer, and that's where we come in, where we can uh, align, you know, the USDA's connection to the agricultural community with DOE's uh, connection to the, you know, the, the technical portion of this with Navy as a customer. And I think, so that's what we're, we uh, are looking to do with this effort, and, um, and we're looking to uh, play a role in, a, in, in our future in building up this domestic capability in the country. Um, to Daniel, um, Tom talked about you know, the importance the Navy can serve as, as a customer in, in some sense in a big kind of way. Um, I know, you know, Enter One, your, your parent company is, is having some financial difficulties really in, in, in part because of looking for that market. You know, how do you as a company, when you're developing a new kind of technology, at this point, you know, it's, it's very open. Is it going to be biofuels? Is it going to be fuel cells? Is it going to be lithium ions? You know, you make bets, I understand that, but, but how challenging is it for you to try to prepare that sort of technology and spend that kind of money knowing that market is in flux in some ways. Right, so it's, it, these are big bets mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that you take, uh, uh, but there is definitely an uncertainty in the way that demand will be materialized. You believe that demand will materialize eventually because you have a very strong value proposition, but, um, but it, it is uncertain how and how fast and uh, to which scale um, things will happen. And, and, and that's part of the risk of, of, of new technology and, and part of the risk of building out new technology because um, uh, there is definitely a, a series in, in scaling up, there are a series of chicken and egg uh, problems. Uh, one of them is, is um, the, the problem of, of uh, uh, demand versus supply. Um, uh, there is an expectation that demand will occur, uh, but demand doesn't occur unless supply is large enough to establish the economies of scale so that so you can get price points that create the demand. But um, and so those two are not really talking to each other. You just, there's, there, there is an expectation that once you get to a certain scale, demand will happen, but it may not happen as, as, as you expect. Um, on, uh, 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 and, and here is where, where, where the government does a very good job. Um, um, if, if government starts um, signaling um, uh, that they have a need for the product and therefore uh, they are willing to say if you build it and meet these speci specifications, we will guarantee that the demand exists, then, um, uh, and then it will exist in this, in this way, then it eliminates that, that source of uncertainty associated with uh, the buildup of scale. Um, but in the, in the private industry, that's, that's a little bit harder to do. Uh, 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 and, and the other chicken and egg that I wanted to, to point out is, is, is um, the idea of, of of specifications of whether when you are when you are going through a, you have a technology in the laboratory, the technology as it scales up changes in performance, and um, and and I see this in the, primarily in the fuel cell side. Um, um, as as uh, um, you can expect a certain performance once you get into the field and mass production. Um, but you, you don't know what that is until you actually get into the field, have mass production, have sold a certain number of these systems, and have field validation. And, and uh, the government actually, uh, and, and the DOD, has done a, a good job in certain aspects of, of um, doing the testing uh, 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 of, of the technology um, such that that uncertainty is reduced. But it's, it's definitely one of the things that that hampers uh, uh, technology and innovation. And another thing is um, 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 the, the military market um, and, and government markets are, 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 are very good to prime the pump mm -hmm. of, of technology. Um, but the really big markets are, are outside, are consumer markets. And, and those really drive your, 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 the value of the company. Uh, you want to have everybody driving you know, cars with, with uh, fuel cells and, and uh, lithium-ion batteries in them. Uh, you want to have every home with uh, distributed generation uh, systems. You want to have telecom power, you know, with baseline, with uh, 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 fuel cell power systems in, in tandem with batteries, etc. These are sort of like where things could go. Um, uh, and and um, however, there, there's a dramatic difference in specifications between the military market and the consumer market. 
And some of the specifications that are given in the military market make it such that technology development takes, up, takes off in a tangent that is hard to bring it back to consumer markets. So, so um, uh, uh, and, and this is an item of discussion I'm, I'm sh I've, I've had with some of the people in the Navy yeah, of how to do that. We've also done some that. things. You've got the internet, you've got GPS. We've, we've done some things. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> power absolutely. Plans. But, but what, what, uh, there's, there's this concept of spiral development mm -hmm. um, that, 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 you know, in, you incre as, as you go and enter new markets, prototype, get new products into the field, um, that information that you obtain with that, even niche market in the product, is the thing that gives you the confidence to go to the big markets. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so definitely, this is, this is the, uh, the, the, the sort of spiral development that... Uh, yeah, I think, I think there's a role there to, 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 for, for government to play in those types of things. We've done it, this is, I mentioned yeah. kind of jokingly, but, but uh, um, I mean, you're right. I mean, the, as you look at the alternative fuels market, for us, for example, we are, would be a large airline if you put a, you know, if you looked at our fuel usage. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, is it, we also have a unique role uh, because, um, you know, I think every major airline, if I'm not mistaken, in the last 10 years has filed for bankruptcy. So there's some credibility issues there that I would argue we don't necessarily have those same ones. Um, and, and so we bring, I think, a, a value to that market and we can help so we really see our ability to help lead the making of this market. I think you're absolutely right. It's going to be, in this case, commercial aviation, commercial maritime as it relates to alternative fuels that are really going to be the ones that make the market. Uh, but we can play that early role that I think government has done time and time again. And I think that's, you know, for us in the Navy, uh, that's what we're looking to do as well. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to go back to, to them. You, you had mentioned, um, I think a lot, lot, not every academic researcher thinks about what ideas can scale up when they're, when they're working on that. Why is that? I mean, you know, is it is it they're not sort of primed? I mean, is is there the sort of mindset necessary among the people who are doing that kind of work to think long term in terms of what what idea will actually have that potential payoff? Uh, you know, what is it that that makes you, I suppose, in your work different in that sense? Well, um, most uh, academic uh, scientists uh, pursue an idea and develop that. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's the sort of acquisition of knowledge of new I ideas, that's oftentimes what is driving uh, innovation. But in order to make that really work, what you have to do is, is then also think about, okay, how are we going to scale it? In the uh, uh, biofuels area, um, one of the realities is there is a lot of uh, infrastructure that you need to build that's not yet there. There's, there's photobio reactor systems. Uh, if you want to pump around a lot of water, there might be much better systems that haven't been developed yet. Uh, so uh, everybody sort of does their part, but the parts don't necessarily all fit together. I mean, uh, biofuels, that has been only something that has been seriously considered again since 2005, 2006. Uh, before that, you know, there were a, a variety of things that kind of didn't pan uh, out quite. Um, so it's, it's really a young set of people coming together uh, in terms of, of uh, knowledge that needs to be put together in something that's actually going to work at mm -hmm. the larger scale. So it's, you know, uh, you, you can't be so broad in uh, science that you, that you know of uh, all the bits and the pieces and, you know, those bits and pieces need to be brought to, uh, together and that takes uh, time and things of of uh, the caliber of uh, uh, 500 million or, or, or so uh, that will be uh, invested uh, by uh, the uh, Navy, that, that's going to be a real driver mm -hmm. in bringing together those, those pieces that we really don't uh, have yet. We, ha we have the pieces, yeah. but they are not a whole. Mm -hmm. Craig, Vent oh. well, Craig Venter, Sorry, just, uh, had sort of implicitly criticized, I think, the way some funding is given out in terms of scientific research, uh, basically for not going after those breakthrough potential ideas. Uh, is that your experience? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, th there, uh, there are some uh, uh, areas that are kind of uh, uh, innovative, and there are those that require 
you to show that you have, a, you have essentially or, or already done the work and then they give you the money to do it, right? Uh, and IH is a bit in the uh, letter uh, mm -hmm. category. Um, there are uh, areas, uh, uh, RPE is probably a good example there of uh, where you're uh, trying to look what you need to do and then put the team together to make that work and bring all the uh, innovations to uh, gather that are and, and some of your really funding need. does come from RPE right, right. Yeah. but you know that that is a quite a different mindset mm -hmm. that's more on the uh, DARPA model mm -hmm. whereas the uh, NSF for example they have been always saying yeah we are we need to uh, recognize uh, innovation much more but at the panel level that never gets done because their funding rates are so awfully low that they can't take any risks. Uh, right. You know, they have, they have uh, problems funding stuff that is really working and uh, that is going places. And then to say, okay, you know, here we have some really innovative proposals that we need to fund. There's just not the uh, uh, money to actually uh, make that, uh, make that uh, work. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Daniel, you wanted Yeah, I, I, I wanted to, to, to point out that in, in you asked the question uh, as, as along the same vein, um, uh, in that, in that um, even though the technology that you're working on is not uh, globally scalable, it may be locally scalable, and therefore it, it has merit. Um, and the, the I'm sorry, when you say locally scalable. Like, like, for scale example, for example um, I, I don't believe that there has to be one fuel for the entire world. You know, uh, that, that, that to me doesn't really make much sense, actually, uh, because the planet is very diverse, and the uh, resources that exist around the world are, are diverse, and, and therefore your local resource may be good enough for you to fuel a town, a city, or a, or a, or a group of resources may be able to, to, to fuel a town or a city or a portion of it. And, and therefore, you don't have to be thinking about it in terms of global magnitude. Now, it, from from venture capital standpoint, it really looks great to think about things in ven like, you know, I'm going to create that fuel that's going to fuel the entire world. But but I think that that's not very pragmatic because you end up into infrastructure problems and and uh, scale up problems. Um, and 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 uh, uh, but when you know we we talked earlier about the cell phone model um, in which you know they iridium satellites and everything, you know, and that's very global and scale up. And then local guys are going around with, you know, towers and cell phones and, and that, that just have towers and radio for right. people. Right, but we, I mean, we have a long way to get before we get anywhere near the entire world. I mean, just to right. electric vehicles, I mean, so, like it's so going to be less than 1% so, so in the next five so years. The, right? So the idea of, of, of market, market segmentation and pathway mm -hmm. is critical. So, so instead, of saying, instead of saying everything has to be scale up, sc scalable, you can say, no, 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 it's okay to have something something that is mediocre in this in this area, but it works in this situation, and therefore it allows you it starts creating the pathways and the potential serendipities mm -hmm. that create real innovation that will take you to the next step. I see what you mean, but it is I, you know, I said something, it is sort of tough in energy for that way because you're it's it's not like cell phones in the sense that you were adding essentially a new industry that that even though when first when it began the f phones were the size of car batteries and barely worked and gave you brain cancer properly, but they were adding an entirely new set of values. Whereas with a lot of renewable energy, we're talking about, you know, you're not necessarily adding, you may add value in terms of energy security, in terms of diversification, certainly in terms of cleaning up the environment, um, but in terms of functionality, not necessarily so. So it just seems like that, that challenge is, is all the greater. And I wanted to, to ask you, in terms of, obviously a big part of this is improving your technology. The better your, your fuel cells, the better your batteries get, the, the more competitive you'll be. How important is manufacturing to doing that, you know, it's not can't, it's not just about being in lab. I mean, and that's you get your chicken and egg situation. I know because yeah. of course manufacturing these kind of things is not cheap by any means. Yeah, absolutely, no, absolutely not. That, and and it's, it's 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 one of the biggest hurdles, and and um, and it's it's a hurdle in two areas. One is is you need a lot of capital to go to manufacturing. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to hit price points, and uh, and you have a technical uncertainty associated with it. And so and so, um, for example, our company has 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 a. a uh, put a lot of manufacturing effort in, in, in the United States, in Indianapolis. Some of our competitors are definitely putting a lot of manufacturing capabilities outside the United States and, and taking advantage of, of um, um, structural benefits from that, you know. But, but, um, uh, and, uh, uh, but one of the, the, the games that you play is, is, is 
the further, you know, how you do manufacture also affects your capacity to do product development mm. and, and, and enhancements of the product. So the farther away you put manufacturing from your R&D, the less capabilities to do the breakthrough R&D becomes because you are farther away from the real problems of the product. And so, and, and that's actually a problem that the United States is facing mm -hmm. moving into the future in terms of innovation because innovation actually comes from not having feedback from the customer and having feedback from the manufacturing plant and what's going wrong. And so, um, uh, you know, as a company, you have to balance that uh, uh, sort of, of risk of, of um, detangling yourself from manufacturing if you're a startup, mm -hmm. um, or do you keep it and then you need much higher, <laughs> you're taking on much higher risk and much higher uh, capital requirements. Right. So, yeah. This does, is I mean, does, you know, and not to, not to step on the, the toes of the, the government policy panel, which is coming later, but I mean, you know, is, is it reasonable to expect a company like yours to be able to weather these, these difficulties? I mean, to spend tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to produce these, to sort of do that, go through that learning cycle while trying to create a market knowing this is all very uncertain. Well, I, I, think, I think it's worth it because nothing is wasted. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll give you an example of, of where our company comes from, okay? Um, um, we are, uh, uh, the, the NR, NR Dell, which is the battery component of NR1, grows out of a joint venture and eventually a buyout of the Delphi battery technology. Now, why is Delphi giving up its battery technology? Because EV1 failed, mm. right? So, so it's not wasted. It's just in the, in the public's mind, it's a series of failures. But failure is a requirement for success. If you're always winning, you're running with losers, okay? So you must, you must be willing to recognize that there are gonna be failures and, and, and barriers in the way, but that those are very important for your learning curve. And so, and so, um, uh, and, and nothing is wasted. So we now have this technology and we've enhanced it. And uh, the same happens on the, on the, on the side of uh, uh, the fuel cell. The fuel cell, uh, company, Enerfuel, is, is um, riding, <laughs> riding high uh, on the innovation of a bunch of companies that have done well, badly, and failed, you know, all over the gamut. But the technology stays behind, advancements have stayed behind, people have stayed behind with know-how that allow you to move the technology forward and, and, and continue to develop and get it closer to, to the finish line. So, so um, um, yeah, you have to have an appetite for that. But I like, yeah, and, and I like that line, that, you know, only losers run with back winners. But, but I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's a very, it makes it sound like a very painful process as well from an economic perspective, you know, I mean, just it's going, the, the failure is going to be part of that. And, and I wanted to, to turn to, to Tom, I, you know, the U.S. Navy does not have shareholders, um, but you are, well, clear, well I guess, right? yeah, taxpayers, <laughs> exactly. So you are obviously responsible to them. Um, do you, you know, I mean, do you, or do you have concerns about meeting these kind of goals, or what if, if these goals prove harder to meet? And I, and I also wanted to ask you about, you know, that the RAND study that I know you're, you're aware of from, from earlier this year that questioned, I think, uh, the military and the, and the Navy's focus, especially on biofuels. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you could respond to that as well. But I mean, how do you deal with, are you ready to accept that kind of failure that might be part of this process? Well, I mean, I think uh, another way to say what was just said is, you know, you can't have innovation without failure. I mean, that's just part of, yeah, you know, I think, you know, in innovation is a function of many things, and one of them is, is your tolerance for risk. And if you have no tolerance for failures, you're not going to get the innovation that you want. And I think, you know, as we, we have our own um, programs through the Office of Naval Research and the Naval Research Lab and, and through other efforts, the Small Business Investment uh, Innovator Research Program, where we invest in um, emerging technologies um, or, or, or provide grants for emerging technologies, and, and not all of them work, and, 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 but we, we, you learn from those, and those companies learn from those failures, and other companies learn from those. And, and the, and, but you're advancing things down the, down the field and, and toward a, a better solution, I think. And whether it's a, a failure because of business, whether it's a failure because of the technology, but you learn in that. And I think that's important um, <coughs> um, ability for all of government, and uh, I would say any investor, to accept that type of risk. And as you look at the venture capital community, I mean, that's what they do. They're in the business of assuming some failure threshold, uh, and that's how they make or break themselves, I suppose. Um, 
uh, on that second question, um, I would, uh, with respect to the report that came out in January, I would uh, reference folks, and I think it's up on uh, OSD's website now, to uh, a report done that the following year, uh, um, but, but just recently released from LMI, that is a very thorough understanding of the, I would characterize it, of the alternative fuels market. Uh, done with a number of folks uh, across academia and others to really uh, try to understand all the different uh, aspects of the market. Uh, the report that came out last January, I, I think, was uh, unfortunate, and it um, and, and it, it its conclusions, I think, were ultimately flawed. And we've made that uh, we've been public about that, and we've said that to the Hill as well, and we've talked to members of Congress uh, as well on this. Um, and it was flawed for, for these reasons. I mean, it, it suggested that the best near-term solution for the government um, as it relates to alternative fuels was to, um, and if there's anybody in this room, you know, we can talk later about this, but was to essentially look at um, uh, coal to liquid, look at Fisher Tropes, but really looking at coal to liquid fuels um, and, and to mitigate the uh, kind of emissions penalty you would get from that suggested that w we uh, invest in and, 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 and tap into carbon capture and storage. Okay, so um, coal liquid. Well, uh, you know, it, it's been, it, it, that's the, the technology, Fisher Tropes behind that's been around since, you know, World War II. It's, it's, it's fine. It, it, it can be done for good and for, I would say, not so good. As it relates directly to coal liquid or coal, li coal plus biomass, I think uh, we've seen those as well. Um, the challenges are the emissions that you get from that. We are prohibited in the government from procuring fuels that have a life cycle greenhouse gas emissions uh, worse than what we're currently using, petroleum. Uh, and uh, without some other mitigation, coal liquid just doesn't do that. So the other mi the mitigation that's uh, put, that's suggested is carbon capture and storage, which, by the way, we haven't done yet in this country. I mean, lots of research going on. It's important research. Uh, that DOE and others are doing, but we haven't done it at commercial scale. And then lastly, I would just say the cost to build such a facility, uh, by the authors, I think, own admission, is five to ten billion dollars is what you need to do to get it at scale. Uh, and we don't even, and, and, and it doesn't even talk about the, um, the, the, the impact to water, the impact to the environment, and where you're going to site one of these things. Um, I think there's a lot more effort that could go into that, those, uh, those technologies, whether it's carbon capture and storage, fissure tropes, and those processes. But to offer that um, as the best near-term solution in light of what we see as, as the, how quickly the, alternative, the other alternative uh, fuels markets are developing in biofuels and, and other areas. It, it just didn't make sense to us. And, and uh, we, we reflected that back to the Hill, back to the author. Uh, who, by the way, didn't engage the Navy in his report, but um, that's, just, that's just a nit. Right. But, but anyway, so but I would, I would um, encourage folks to really look at the LMI report because I'll just say this. I don't agree with everything that's in that, but I think it's a fair and balanced report. And I think this other one, um, I, would, I wouldn't put that same label on. It would be ironic to have like a 21st century Navy that suddenly is being fueled by coal again. A bit of right. a, a throwback. I mean, if anything, let's go back to sale. Right, right you know, seriously, so. why not? But I mean, that's <laughs> zero no, emissions that, whatsoever. Officially, that's not the Navy's position. Let's <laughs> uh, <laughs> be clear. Um, we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, right down there. The question is for Wim. If you are trying to get algae to secrete their oil, which is a laudable goal, everyone would like to do it, you are going to be facing a challenge. You either need sterile reactors because you don't want bacteria eating that oil as fast as they can get it, but if you have the sterile reactors, it's going to be too expensive to make for fuel and you're going to be using a lot of antibiotics. How are you going to deal with that? Yeah, that is uh, indeed a fair uh, question and a difficult one. Um, there are uh, methods, you know, just as much as you can put in to a cyanobac bacterium or alga the potential to make uh, fatty acids, you can also have them make things that will, uh, that will kill off competitors. So it's just one more step of synthetic biology that uh, you can uh, employ. And 
you know, we are working on making that happen. Um, indeed, uh, st uh, sterility is a difficult thing, but uh, there are also uh, compounds. I mean, uh, uh, some of the fatty acids are fairly uh, non-biocompatible. The shorter the uh, chain length gets, the less other organisms actually can use it as a feedstock for themselves. So there are, you know, a, a variety of ways uh, around it, and you know, it's not uh, uh, something that has a solution right at this uh, moment. But there are four or five different ways that collectively will uh, uh, yield one. Right there, that's it. This question is, is for you, Mr. Hicks. Uh, my understanding was that the U.S. Air Force is flying on coal to liquids uh, today and is certifying their, their aircraft on that fuel. Um, so are there differing regulations for the Navy versus uh, the Air Force, or is there any attempt to uh, maybe rationalize policy across all the branches? Um, the Air Force is not flying on coal to liquids today. They are uh, held to the same fuel uh, requirements that we are. Any fuel uh, that they purchase that's not petroleum um, must have a life cycle greenhouse gas emissions profile equal to or less than petroleum. That's the law. It's Section 526 of ESA 2007. Um, that said, they did have a program that invested in and in, in, in did testing and certification along those areas. I think as ESA 2007 came out, um, that, that made that more difficult for them. I will say they have a, a very aggressive uh, testing program and certification program, as do we. we. We have completed all of our manned and unmanned uh, aircraft testing, and we're in the process of doing the same for our surface vessels. Uh, we share data between Air Force and Navy back and forth on similar platforms. Uh, and we, um, um, and, and they have efforts underway now looking and in, in testing and certifying around uh, HRJs. Uh, they're looking at cellulosic fuels, alcohol to jet. You know, they're, so they're, they, they're uh, very much, uh, I think, have moved, moved on from that uh, area. Um, so I think that might have been true in the past. But we, as a uh, DOD, as a government, are not allowed to purchase those fuels. Um, and uh, frankly, I, I think um, that as DOD has said as well, uh, that provision in, in ESA 2007 is, is good policy. We can argue about if it's well written, but it's good policy and I think it's uh, something that we need to take seriously because it has impacts to, um, you know, uh, not, not just, uh, uh, it has impacts into making the right choices about, uh, about fuels. So. It's time for just one more question. Yeah, uh, Chao Chen, persistent man, uh, Mr. Heck. So far, it seems uh, nuclear energy work fine for Navy. Uh, will Navy increase the uh, nuclear usage in the future? So all of our uh, subs and all of our um, carriers uh, are nuclear powered, and, um, and that accounts for about 17% of our total energy use. Uh, those were done because they made economic sense, but also because they gave us additional mission capabilities. We can now go underwater for months at a time without having to refuel uh, steam our carriers for you know half a year or more, uh, and, and actually we can go longer, much longer than that, and not have to kind of uh, do any refueling. Um, I think as we look at other potential platforms, uh, that's something that we'll continue to look at, um, and, and, and whether that makes sense to bring into other platforms it's going to be more driven kind of from the economic perspective. Now, uh, on the shore side, you know, we, so we have, I think, uh, I, well, I know we have uh, safely uh, used uh, nuclear power for the you know, better part of 60 years in our fleet. Um, and so as there's a lot of folks who think we could have those similar sized reactors, the small modular reactors, and use those for our shore facilities. Uh, and, and that's an area of, that we're looking at as well. I think, though, it's a... Um, uh, you know, we're looking toward forward to, say, Oak Ridge National Lab. I know they're looking to put a small modular reactor in and how that will go through uh, the uh, NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Committee, about, you know, the process and the permitting of that. Um, uh, I, I think 
some folks think that the Navy or DOD has some ability to ignore um, uh, certain laws, environmental. We, we are held to the, the same, if not higher, standards um, for that. So we would still have to go through the same environmental permitting, the same, uh, uh, you know, all the other permitting that's going to be associated with something like that. So uh, that's, uh, I, I think it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis on, on that end, as well as with our ships. But I think what we have today, we're very comfortable with and. Uh, as you'll see with the, our new carrier coming out, it's also going to be nuclear powered and we're committed to our carriers and subs for nuclear power. Okay. Well, thank you very much to our panel and thanks for your attention as well. Thank you, Brian.